which is to invite Dr. Brett Summerall to speak to us. Approximately um, 30 to 45 minutes, and hopefully there'll be a bit of time for some questions. Now, John, I'm not 100% sure that I know how to share the screen, so I'm relying on you or Ralph to actually do that. But um, I would very much like to welcome Brett to our meeting and, uh, and say how much we appreciate him taking the time. He is the Director of Research and the Chief Botanist at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney. And uh, he's going to be speaking to us on the Banks and Solander collection held at the gardens and also about bushland regeneration following the recent fires. So um, if you do have questions that you would like to ask as Brett is going through his speech, feel free to use the little chat button that's the bottom middle of your screen and you can um, type in a question which will then appear in the chat box. Although we will also stop for a little bit of time at the end of the talk and, uh, uh, and for Brett to answer any questions that you might have. So Ralph or John, is there anything else that I need to do to get that moving? No, Brett is able to um, share his own screen. It's all good to go. All right. Well, thank you again, everybody, for coming to the AGM and welcome to Brett. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. That's good. Well, that's a good start. And can can everyone see see my screen that I've just um, shared with you all? Yes. Yes. Thumbs up. Yeah. All right. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, that's a good start. So. Um, it is real, it's a real pleasure to be able to talk, talk to you this afternoon. The plan was that um, we'd be doing a, a bit of a walk and talk around, around Botany Bay and, and having a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, there were lots of plans, um, but uh, of course they've all gone astray somewhat because of the current situation. Um, technically I'm supposed to be looking at terracotta warriors in China today, but um, that didn't happen either. So it's, um, yeah, it's been quite a, a disappointment from that point of view. So um, what I wanted to do today is to, to meld, I suppose, really two talks uh, in one. Uh, one is to, uh, a, a quick um, overview of the, the Banks and Solander collection, what they did uh, when they visited Botany Bay and other parts of Australia, and also to talk a little bit about, after that, about the, the, uh, the impact of the bushfires um, on vegetation, in New, in New South Wales, but with a, a real specific focus on the impact that's happened at the, uh, some of the areas around Mount Tomar uh, Botanic Gardens, around the Blue Mountains Botanic Gardens at Mount Tomar, um, because it's been a, a good opportunity for us to, to go back and, and revisit it on multiple occasions to, just to see how vegetation is responding and, and the like. So um, um, let's see how we go. Um, so a little bit over 250 years ago, um, April 28th, so I think around about this day, somewhat north of Smoky Cape, heading into, into uh, what's now Queensland. But on April 28th, for an eight day period around then, Banks and Solander, with Cook and a group of, other, group of the, the other voyagers on the Endeavour, landed at Botany Bay. And that, um, resulted in a, a fair amount of intensive collecting and, um, and the like that happened over that period of time. And so I just wanted to go through a little bit about what's happened, what happened, what they collected, and also a little bit about the collections that they have that we have now, some of which we now have the opportunity to um, maintain and restore and keep in, in good condition at the, at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney. Um, it's also probably appropriate that I, I, I acknowledge that um, a couple of my former supervisors, Barbara Briggs and Gwen Harden, are, are listening to the talk today, which puts me in, in a little bit of a nervous uh, frame. Um, but they've, they were also had responsibility for these fantastic collections uh, when they were both um, in their positions at the, the Botanic Gardens. So Cook, um, the, the Endeavour voyage was quite an amazing voyage when you think about it. The, the, uh, the length of time it took, the number of locations they, they stayed, 
uh, stopped at and the number of points in different places that they collected on. So they were collecting plant material from basically from the, the sub-Antarctic to the tropics. So with a number of stops along the way throughout um, a couple of locations in South America, one of them somewhat illegally, uh, collections in Rio, down to um, the, uh, the, uh, the southern tip of, of the South American continent. Of course, across to Tahiti for the where they were their main purpose of the voyage, which was to observe the transit of Venus, uh, and then the circumnavigation around New Zealand, the attempt to find the great, the fabled southern land, and the recognition then that it wasn't there, and moving across to to go up the east coast of Australia, uh, a pretty pretty horrible um, stay at Batavia, uh, where a, a variety of illnesses caused all sorts of problems with the crew. Um, it would have been a remarkably a remarkable case of um, industrial safe work and safety, work health work health and safety. If they hadn't had stopped at Batavia, they would have gone through with relatively few deaths, which would have been an amazing uh, thing and a, and a, a good uh, commendation to the work that um, that Cook did in terms of keeping his crew healthy. Um, of course, it was um, the the voyage was of course led by. Um, uh, James Cook, then a lieutenant, um, lieutenant, and um, on the Endeavour. So the main science, scientific aims of the Endeavour voyage were obviously to observe the transit of Venus at Tahiti, to map the coastline of all the lands that they visited, and to document the natural history of the waters and the lands visited during the, the voyage. And that's really the, the focus that we have in terms of our interest and understanding of the trip. Uh, the scientific participants were, were Banks, Joseph Banks, Daniel Solander, uh, Herman Sporing, a Finnish naturalist, um, who also was somewhat of a, uh, kept a lot of the notes and the, the um, manuscripts and the, the uh, periods, information they collected together. Uh, the astronomer Charles Green, obviously very important for the, the uh, observation of the transit of Venus. And two artists, Sidney Parkinson and Alexander Buchan. There are uh, also three other um, uh, Workers from Banks' estate, um, sadly, I think two of them perished in, in the southern part of South America from uh, an ill-prepared trip up to some of the high country there where they caught fevers, uh, got cold and caught fevers, um, but, uh, and one other that um, perished, I think, in Batavia. Um, Banks was a relatively young man when the trip started. So, um, as you can see, seven, born in 1743, so, uh, turning 27 just before they um, hit the, the coast of, of Australia. He was the son of William Banks, a wealthy landowner, uh, and he sunk a lot of money into this trip. Um, a lot of the, the um, scientific participants he employed personally and provided, and provided the provisions and the, the equipment, the blotting paper, huge um, chests and the like to keep the specimens in. Um, and a range of things. So he sunk a lot of the, a lot of funding and a lot of money into this trip. So it, it was quite a, an endeavor. And for somebody that young, um, I think when he left, he's, he was about the same age that my son is now. And so the thought of, of somebody of that age uh, heading off to this trip is, um, is quite bewildering to me. The other main botanical participant was Daniel Solander. Um, He's a Swede. Um, he was a student of the great Carl Linnaeus at Uppsala University and had moved to, to London in 1760 to promote binomial classification, obviously uh, the classification that was created and developed by Linnaeus back in, in Uppsala. So uh, he'd come to promote that as a, a, a methodology for um, classifying all sorts of organisms for, for a ways in which we could all communicate which species we were talking about in, in, a, in a great deal of way. He worked at the British Museum from 1763 and then after the trip as Banks' secretary and librarian post 1771 when they returned back to, to London. Um, sadly, he died at a relatively young age in, the, in his 50s um, at, um, or nearly 50 at, at Banks' house, house of a presumed brain hemorrhage. Um, it, it's very sad that he um, died at that age because it would have made a huge difference to the way in which a lot of the work that a lot of the collections that were put together in from uh, the endeavour and from the trip would have been much better, much more effectively documented had he had he lived longer. 
Um, where they located, where they landed at Botany Bay and all areas around there, um, was it's quite a, a fortuitous place when you think about it, because it's um, a relatively diverse um, ecosystem a set of ecosystems. So you've got eucalyptus woodlands, um, sclerophyllous scrub on sand dunes and Hawkesbury sandstone. So quite an interesting in place. And of course, it's it's now gazetted, been gazetted as a public reserve and, and now within the Kamei Botany Bay National Park uh, in that area. But uh, it's it was quite a fortuitous place in which we, uh, in which the, they were just were able to, to land. And when you look at the, the vegetation communities that have uh, exist at Botany Bay. It's quite diverse um, and I'm, I'm grateful to the work that um, Doug Benson, uh, a, a former ecologist at the, the Bet Botanic Gardens and now an honorary research associate who um, has put together some really uh, great papers and, and books together, many of which documented what would have been happening at, at uh, Botany Bay back in 1770 and also what's there now. So you can see it's quite a diverse um, different types of ecosystems and quite a diverse range of different species that would have been that were present at the site um, and um, I'm, I'm starting to, to bring in a few photos of the, some of the collections this is one of the uh, 1770 collections of, of Banks and Solander or Callistum and uh, Citrinus there and um, uh, yeah, and as you can see the, the collections are, are, are still in a for, for their age for, for being 250 years old are still in a fantastic state and, and condition Obviously, the site has quite changed now uh, to what it was in, in 1770. So it's uh, aspects of it have been used and abused somewhat. And that's probably a reflection of what's happened to the Australian flora over that 250 year period. But there are still um, areas in which are not that dissimilar to uh, what Banks and Solander would have seen uh, when they, they landed there. Perhaps not the skyline in the background that you might be able to see in the background of this shot of uh, looking across to the to the city there from Tower Point. Um, uh, and the, the site is obviously really important from the point of view of the uh, what happened to Australia, the colonisation of Australia, the way in which things have changed and and how it's had an, an impact then on the, the future history of the site and also the, the impact that it would have had on the, that it obviously had on the original inhabitants of the site and the, uh, the, the impact that we see there now. There are areas where this um, quite interesting and diverse uh, vegetation, apart from the, the uh, heathy vegetation, uh, these Liverstoners, and there was also there's also some very nice specimens that they collected of the Liverstoners uh, in that collection. But of course, there are areas where it's other species have been planted into the site um, because it was thought it was a bit more uh, statuesque and interesting to make to to make these changes there. But it's still a, uh, an interesting place from that point of view, with quite a lot of diversity there at, at, um, at Botany Bay. The plants that they collected were, um, were quite diverse. So 132 different species were collected. Uh, it inclu included six ferns and, and gymnast ferns, 24 monocotyledons, including nine grasses. And they spent most days collecting. It was also important to remember that they did spend some time trying to curate the the collections that they already had collected, um, trying to keep the collections um, mould free, insect free, and not being um, beaten up by uh, rodents and the like that were in the ship was, was also a, a substantial task. But they, they made collections at Kernel Peninsula, which was the landing site at Bear Island, La Perouse Peninsula, Cooks's River, the mouth of the Georgian River and the coast towards Cronulla. So they, they got around quite a, a range of area over that period of time. And um, as I said, 132 species were collected. It's also really quite interesting to reflect on the fact that they were, you know, obviously collecting at in late April, early May, and it's not the most exciting time to um, to be collecting uh, in that that sort of heathy vegetation. I think it would have really, if they were there in in late August, early September, it really would have blown their mind to see the the diversity of species that would have been flowering then. Um, would have would have made a huge difference in terms of the numbers of collections and what they could collect from that point of view. The most um, charismatic and I suppose iconic of the, the specimens that they caught they collected were the banksias 
that they collected over that period of time. And these specimens caused quite the, the, the impact uh, when they got back to London. They're quite interesting, quite unique and different from a lot of what they were seeing, obviously bearing some similarities to some of the proteaceae that, they, that um, were perhaps better known at that point of time from, from South Africa but um, still caused quite a, uh, a commotion when they got back. So they had quite a lot of specimens collected uh, from uh, different places on the, the trip that they were collecting uh, from in the Banksia. So Banksia serrata in this particular case, and this is probably our most photographed specimen and, and the, the specimen that we most often show when we're having visitors, uh, it's the one we drag out when we've got potential donors and the like and the, we're, we're in, interested in trying to get a little bit of uh, a financial support for the, the organisation and, and for our science and for the herbarium. Uh, the Erisopholia um, is also, there's some great specimens of the, the Banksia's Erisopholias that they described. Um, this interesting because it was described by um, Carl Linnaeus's son, Linnaeus the Younger, as it's used, often used in the, um, the uh, when the, they're talking about it in terms of the, the um, the specimens and the type specimens. Um, and as you can see, um, the specimens would have looked quite fantastic. The plants would look quite fantastic when they were collecting them in May. Uh, a lot of Banksia aerosifolia are a real good um, flower at the moment and really looking very interesting and would have been quite, quite the show. Uh, some of the other specimens that they've collected, Viola banksii is a really interesting um, plant. Um, uh, only relatively recently described as a, spe a separate species uh, by Kevin Teeley and Susan Prober in, in 2003. So this tiny little specimen is the type specimen uh, for this species that's in our collection. And, but it's, um, it's a really lovely little plant, used a lot in, in horticulture, um, and, and um, I'm sure many of you probably grow it any, as, as well in terms of your own collections. But it's, a, it's an interesting demonstration of the fact that the, what's presumed um, to be quite uh, a standard species in the collections when it starts to get reviewed, um, even though it might be you know, the best part of 220 years, 230 years later after the collections that you can still find uh, that these species are being worked on. They're still scientifically relevant and they're still being used by botanists all around the world uh, when they review and, and re-describe these, these species. Another interesting species that was in, that's uh, in collections and probably is not quite a surprise to many people is Biden's pilosa, which you might know as farmer's friends or cobbler's pegs. Uh, and many of you are probably cursing it at the moment as it's coming up everywhere. Um, I've spent the last periods of isolation trying to get it under control at my place. Um, there's probably many people in the same sorts of scenarios. And it's something that we generally um, think of as an, an introduced weed, an introduced species. Um, Doug did a bit of digging around in terms of what's the likelihood of uh, it being an introduced species anyway, and certainly there were collection, there were um, people came, who came to Australia and visited Australia prior to um, the, to Banks and Solander and Cook, um, so it could potentially have been introduced. This is a great um, uh, species that should be looked at using molecular techniques to to look at using genomics and and um, next generation sequencing to have a look at it and to see what might be uh, the genetic variability across the global um, populations of, of Bidens just to see if we can get a determination on where the center of origin might have been and what's the likely um, scenario that in terms of its, being, its uh, redistribution and its introduction to the very various places might have been. So it's a, it'd be a perfect example to look at and try and um, extract the DNA uh, of both the older specimens, but also the, in populations quite around the, the country. And the techniques and the technology now allows us to, to explore these sorts of um, issues much more effectively. So it'd be an interesting one to look at. Um, of course, once they left Botany Bay, um, there was a, a couple of stops um, at Bustard Bay, sometimes Round Hill or 1770, uh, before they hit the reef. Um, uh, close to Endeavour River. And of course, this meant that they were then stuck uh, for quite a long period of time, seven weeks while the ship was being repaired and allowed for a, quite an extensive amount of collecting to, to occur then. And also 
Um, if ever you've, any of you have, uh, have been to the, the replica of the Endeavour at um, the um, Maritime Museum, you'll know that it's quite a small ship and the, the place where the, the specimens were stored in the ship was um, quite at the bottom of the boat and was um, quite badly impacted by the, the impact with the reef and as a consequence, most of the collections to that date had been uh, submerged or partially submerged in the ocean water. So there was a lot of period of time that they spent um, laying all the collections out on the sails to, to dry and to get them uh, into some sort of condition so that they were able to then put them back in there. Had big large zinc lined chests that they were using to store a lot of the specimens. Those were quite overflowed and you'll, you'll, you understand why that might have been the case. But there's some fantastic collections from uh, around the Endeavour River, Cooktown area uh, that they made while they were there um, uh, for that long period of time. And in, in, when you read the, the journal of Banks, that he, he notes that they pretty much exhausted the flora uh, in that period of time. And so they were sort of twiddling their fingers a little bit, trying to, to wait till the, the ship was ready to sail off to the next stop. Um, in terms of the whole trip, the specimens to where they collected, um, over the whole period of time, they collected an estimated roughly 1,400 new plant species. So it's a huge number of new species and approximately 30,000 specimens. Uh, the majority of those specimens are still at, are now at the Natural History Museum in London. They made collections at Madeira, Rio and Tierra del Fuego. Uh, huge collections um, at New Zealand and also in Tahiti. And in Australia, they collected approximately 500 species. So uh, 132 down in Botany Bay, and the remainder in, in three locations in, um, in North Queensland, the majority of which were around Endeavour River. So a huge um, a collection from Australia that was really quite significant and also a really very important um, collection from New Zealand that's um, really important in terms of the understanding of the, the New Zealand flora uh, from that point in time. Uh, the trip home was uh, somewhat curved I'd mentioned before, it linked up Queensland coast uh, and then across to Batavia in the Dutch East Indies. Um, and the, the ship was repaired here more effectively, but many of the crew became ill with dysentery and malaria. All but 10 of the participants, all the members of the crew were affected and Parkinson's, Sporing, Monkhouse all died as well as 20 other crew members. So um, the a great tragedy that um, Parkinson uh, died in particular. He's an, an amazing artist and um, had done a lot of work both in the sketches when he was uh, out collecting with, with Banks and Solander. It's sort of interesting to think that Parkinson was all, is a sort of that personal equivalent of what we might do when we're out collecting now with a smartphone or whatever. Um, he was making lots of sketches, lots of notes, lots of notes about the colours uh, and then doing some of the paintings while the ship was sailing between um, different destinations. Uh, so it was a great tragedy that these, these um, members of the crew were, uh, were killed. They arrived at Dover on the 12th of July in 1771, and then the specimens were all um, transported to, to Banks's um, residence. Solander, Linnaeus the Younger and, and Joseph Gertner, uh, as well as Banks all worked on the material. Uh, they used Parkinson's illustrations to assist in the descriptions. There were 700 plates uh, that were engraved but were never completed. Um, and this was complicated by a whole range of reasons. Solander's death was obviously important. Um, Banks was heavily involved in the establishment of Q and a whole lot of uh, internal science politics and, and, and full on uh, economic politics within, the, within London. Uh, there's wars in France, economics, recession, all of these contributed to the to a slow um, impact of the being able to, to uh, do the work. All of the specimens ended up in the British Museum. Uh, for those of you who've been in London recently, this is the Natural History Museum. But significant numbers were repatriated to Australia. Um, uh, Joseph Maiden was particularly important in, in bringing those to, to, um, to, the, to, the, um, to Sydney. But there's also, and we have 833 specimens now at the National Herbarium of New South Wales. Uh, at the Royal Botanic Garden, Sydney. Um, we actually discovered a, a, uh, an additional specimen the other week as we were doing the, 
the digitisation project at the, the Botanic Gardens and um, where we're actually photographing all of the 1.43 million, estimated 1.43 million specimens of the herbarium collection uh, in very high resolution, which will eventually be uh, freely accessible to everybody on the internet. So um, going through the boxes, we occasionally come across some gems and certainly when we pulled out a random box uh, in the Favaci collection and found a glycine that been, had been collected by Banks and Solander, that was a, a fantastic uh, surprise to the, to the volunteers that were helping with that project. So um, yeah, one of the treasures that you sometimes come across. For a trip that collected 1,400 new species, there's relatively few type specimens that arose as a result of the, um, of the trips. The Banksias that were collected, particularly um, Banksia serrata, Integrifolia, and Aerosifolia, and there's another Banksia that's also ended up as a, as a type specimen, I think, um, were, were, um, were described, and were used and described by Linnaeus uh, the Younger. Uh, the Corymbia gamifera, which was then uh, eucalyptus, angophras, melaleucas, and a few of the other uh, myrtaceae, uh, and, and of course the Viola banksii ended up as being a type specimen um, 220 odd years later, 230 odd years later. So relatively few of the specimens ended up being type specimens, which is, um, probably gives you a good indication of the, the way in which Banks was preoccupied with a whole bunch of of stuff um, post the trip. He, was, he, he became quite the celebrity, um, became an advisor, a trusted advisor to the King, uh, and very heavily involved as the president of the Royal Society for a long period of time. Uh, and um, he did, didn't, um, didn't do as much of the, you would expect of the botany that might have happened. Um, he was very influential in Australian botany post that. He sent out a series of botanists um, to, to collect the flora. It was very influential in the selection of Robert Brown, Cunning and Cayley, all of those push, uh, promoted and pushed by him to come out to work with some various members of the, the New South Wales um, governors at that stage. Uh, he played a key role in the promotion of, of Australia and New, New South Wales selection for the penal colony um, and very influential in regarding selection of New South Wales government. Some of governors, some of those were good and some of those not so good as being um, mentioned in, in various circles. So he played a really important role in the establishment of New South Wales and Australia for better or worse. Um, that brings me to the end of the, the first part of the talk where I talk about Banks and Solander, but I wanted to put in a gratuitous plug for a, a book that the, our Flora Legium Society is um, just putting out at the moment. The, so we have a Flora Legium Society, which is a group of of botanical artists and includes some of the absolute best um, botanical artists uh, in the country and in the world. Um, and they've put together a, a group of uh, 43, 45 uh, botanical paintings of specimens that were collected by Banks and Solander on, on this trip. So they've, uh, and the, there's a, a, a narrative about each of the species uh, and a few other um, sections in there. So if you're interested in um, securing a copy of the book, I think it's 65, dollars if I remember uh, at the moment. So it's a limited edition. We've, I think we've only printed 500 copies of it, but the, um, the, they're selling that at the moment. And if you go to the, the Botanic Gardens website, all the details on the, the, um, the website can be found there. I suppose if you Google, do a Google search on Botanic Endeavour, you'll probably uh, find that okay. Um, but we were hoping that we would have it on e the paintings on exhibition at, at Lion Gate Lodge at the Botanic Gardens in Sydney uh, at this very present point in time, but unfortunately, um, obvious things have happened. So we hope to put that on an exhibition um, either later in this, in this year, maybe around November or earlier in the first half of next year. Um, so we'll, I'll, I'll keep people posted of that outcome.